Again, I want to welcome everyone to uh, the fall season, believe it or not, of our Randall's Island Park Alliance Literary Program. Uh, we are having going to be hosting four work, uh, four conversations about the book Braiding Sweetgrass. So we hope that many of you have had the opportunity to read it or get started with it. Um, we have been in touch with libraries to make sure that they're trying to keep them in stock so that people can have access to them as well. Um, Elizabeth Howard is back as our uh, writer in residence and host uh, for the for the evening, and we have two wonderful guest speakers that I would like to just take a moment to introduce. Um, so uh, the first of our two speakers is Roger Hernandez Jr. He's a native New Yorker born and raised in El Barrio, East Harlem. He's a graduate of Southampton College, Long Island University with a BA in environmental sociology and Hunter College with an MS in urban planning and community development. Um, he served as a New York State Assembly Legislative Intern for William B. Hoyt in Buffalo and his subcommittee on water resources. And then he served for NOAA at Woods Hole Northeast Fisheries Center as an ocean oceanographic intern. Returning to East Harlem, he became an advocate and activist uh, for New York City's community development. He serves on the board of the director for the Taller uh, Baruka, Barucoa Cultural Arts Gallery and the United Confederation of Taino People and the Presencia Tania. He has written and researched the Ramapo tribe of the Lenape Nation and the United Confederation of Taino People under the Treaty of Cooperation to complement each other's objectives and goals. Through his work, he has identified the Native Americans who made up the Upper East Side, their summer fishing camp location in East Harlem, that attracted the early Dutch settlers to establish trade relations, thus creating New, new Harlem as their second outpost in Manhattan. He is working to establish a memorial to New York City's Aboriginal peoples as a complement to the proposed Harlem African burial ground located across First Avenue at 126th Street. So please uh, welcome Roger. Um, and then Evan, Evan Pritchard, um, is the director of the Center for Algonquin Culture in Rosendale, New York. He has been interviewing traditional Native elders for over 30 years. He has a, a lectured on Native studies at colleges including Vassar, Pace, Marist, Columbia University, SUNY, and several others. He is the author of over 50 books on Native culture and history, including Native New Yorkers, Henry Hudson and the Algonquins, Bird Medicine, Native American Stories of the Sacred, and No Word for Time. Evan Pritchard has published original maps of Native American settlements in the Hudson Valley, some of which have been included in an online history exhibit funded by the government of the Netherlands. Um, he frequently appears on radio stations, including WBAI and WNYC, and has been featured guest on CNN, ABC, Discovery Channel, History Channel, and the Roger Hernandez 90 Minute Special, Touring Native New York on Manhattan Cable. So we also want to truly welcome Evan and say thank you so much for both of you for joining us. Um, so I am going to turn it over now to Elizabeth um, so we can get started. Again, welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Nikki, and um, welcome to everyone on this really beautiful September evening, autumn and uh, autumn is one of the, my favorite times of the year, and I'm sorry that we're not on Randall's Island. It's a lovely time to bike and walk. But I would be uh, hope I'd love to join any of you there uh, when you'd like to when you'd like to to explore. As Nikki mentioned, this our our book that we're working on this that we're reading this fall is Braiding Sweetgrass: Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge and the Teaching of Plants by Robin Wald Kimmerer. I wanna thank Milkweed Press for sending me a copy of this book over a year ago. Milkweed also published World of Wonders, the book that we read this spring, and they publish books related to nature and poetry. And if you're looking for something to add to your reading list, I, I think you, it might be helpful to go to the Milkweed website. Before we begin our conversation this evening, I also want to thank the readers who joined our Lunch and Lit program this summer. We read Thornton Wilder's Pulitzer winning prize play, um, Our Town, which is set in Grover's Corner, New Hampshire. And if you're not familiar with the play, it reminds us that we should pay attention to everything that's around us. 
we sat at a picnic table with our lunch. We had chocolate cookies and iced tea with the water behind. It was really glorious. And I hope you'll all join us next time. Braiding Sweetgrass was published in 2013 and has become a best-selling book internationally. It's spent about over uh, 70 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. And a week doesn't go by when I don't run into a colleague or a friend who either has read the book or is reading the book. And I continually hear of book groups at museums and churches and other organizations who are also reading Braiding Sweetgrass. Robin, Robin Kimmerer is a mother, a scientist, a professor, and a citizen of the Potawatomi Nation. She threads her insights and her words and her stories through the lens of these three perspectives. In our conversations, we're gonna go beyond the stories and think about how we can read and interpret the history, culture, and nature from the perspective of Native Americans. Unfortunately, Robin Kilmer, because of the demands and many demands on her schedule, was unable to join us for one of our programs. However, we have a very short video of Robin and Helen McDonald, the author of Vesper Flights, the book that we read last winter in conversation. So we thought we would play that short video for you. Together, you spider and I. Absolutely, and I think, you know, um, so my collection is very various. Um, there are essays in it that range from everything from migraines to um, there's, a, there's a report of a refugee's journey to Britain. There's all sorts of things that are not about nature in it. But there's a lot of talk in it about how one of the most pressing things, I believe, is, is to learn to love difference. It's something that we are so bad at doing historically and culturally. And um, there's a wonderful, one of the essays in your book, the one about salamanders, I think ends on that precise note, that notion of getting close to a creature whose world is not like ours, that we traditionally consider to be a little bit weird and slimy, and <laughs> but, but knowing, extending generosity towards those creatures is, a, is an act that is good for our hearts and the way we see others as well as creatures. So I, I really want to thank you for that particular one because it chimes so much with how I, how I think about the natural world these days. Helen, I found the same thing when I, in fact, I copied it out because I love it and I want to have it on my office door to think what it might mean to love those that are not like you, um, that yours is not the only way to see. And that, of course, extending to these intelligences other than our own, you know, warbler intelligence and salamander intelligence, all of those, but but also the extension of that kind of respect and wonder within our own species. What is it like to be you? Um, and that is, I think, part of the pathway to justice is to be able to really see, to see each other, to inhabit for just a, a moment what, what that life might be like. And Thank you. Thank you for, for doing that, Nikki. I thought it gives us a, a sense that we've at least had a chance to meet Robin. This evening, it's our honor and privilege to have Roger Hernandez and Evan Pritchard with us. Nikki has read their extensive bios. Um, Roger, I wonder if you could open our conversation. We always like to, during these programs, at some point, read from the book to hear the words of the author and the poetry. And I wondered if you would read, you know, the, the two, it's just two pages in the beginning of Sky Woman Falling. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Miss Elizabeth. Okay, Sky Woman Falling. In winter, when the green earth lies resting beneath a blanket of snow, this is a time for storytelling. The storytellers begin by calling upon those who came before who pass the stories down to us, for we are only messengers. In the beginning, there was the sky world. She fell like a maple seed, pirouetting on the autumn breeze. A column of light streamed from a hole in the sky world 
marking a path where only darkness has been before. It took her a long time to fall. In fear or maybe hope, she clutched a bundle tightly in her hand. Hurtling downward, she saw only dark water below. But in that emptiness, there were many eyes gazing up at the sudden shaft of light. They saw there a small object, a mere dust mote in the beam. As it grew closer, they could see that it was a woman. Arms outstretched, long black hair flowing behind as she spiraled toward them. The geese nodded at one another and rose together from the water in a wave of goose music. She felt the beat of their wings as they flew beneath to break her fall. Far from the only home she'd ever known, she caught her breath at the warm embrace of soft feathers as they gently carried her downward. And so it began. The geese cannot hold the woman above the water for much longer, so they called the council to decide what to do. Resting on their wings, she saw them all gather. Loons, otters, swans, beavers, fish of all kinds. A great turtle floated in the midst and offered his back for her to rest upon. Gratefully, she stepped from the goose wings onto the dome of the shell. The others understood that she needed land for her home and discussed how they might serve her need. The deep divers among them had heard of mud at the bottom of the water and agreed to find some. Loon dove, fir Loon dove first, but the distance was far too was too far, and after a long while, he surfaced with nothing to show for his efforts. One by one, the other animals offered help. Otter, beaver, sturgeon, but the depth, the darkness, and the pressures were too great for even the strongest of swimmers. They returned grasping for air with all their heads ringing. Some did not return at all. Soon only Muskrat was left, the weakest diver of all. He volunteered to go while the others looked on doubtfully. His small legs flailed as he worked his way downward and he had gone a very long time. They waited and waited for him to return, fearing the worst for their relative. And before long, a stream of bubbles rose from the small limp body of the muskrat. He had given his life to aid this helpless human. And then the others noticed that his paw was tightly clenched. And when they opened it, there was a small handful of mud. Toto said, here, put it on my back and I will hold it. Sky Woman bent and spread the mud with her hand across the shell of the turtle. Moved by the extraordinary gift of the animals, she sang a thanksgiving and then began to dance, her feet caressing the earth. The land grew and grew as she danced her thanks from the dab of mud on turtle's back until the whole earth was made. Not by Sky Woman alone, but from the alchemy of all the animals' gifts coupled with a deep gratitude. Together they form what we know today as Turtle Island, our home. Uh, that's so beautiful. That's really beautiful. Um, Evan, Robin Kimmer asks us, how in our modern world can we find our way to understand Earth as a gift again, to make our relations with the world sacred again? Now maps help us under you know maps help us understand where we are, where we've been, and where we're going, and they also help us um, provide us knowledge of the landscape. So I thought perhaps you could, as an entree point, show us some of your exquisite maps and tell us a little bit about the history of Native Americans in East Harlem and on Randall's Island. Sure, I would love to. You know, I, I love the maps and I love, I know this sounds cliche, but I love New York. Uh, <laughs> nobody paid me to say that. And um, so, yeah, I love to uh, chart out, do the research and piece together these maps. And the first one I want uh, Nikki to show is the original birth trauma of the uh, multi ethnic place, which is New York City today. And how perhaps, you know, we've all had time to continue to try to overcome differences and misunderstandings 
make peace with each other. So, uh, Nikki, the first map I want to show is John Coleman's uh, unfortunate ride. <laughs> you see that one? Yes. Okay, so the path of blood, as I call it. No, that's not it. Yep. <laughs> No. Nope. Try number one. There you go. That's it. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. No. Okay. So, uh, right away, the first contact in this era, at least, uh, was with Henry Hudson's ship that was parked at Staten Island, and then they sent out an exploratory rowboat. Uh, led by a very strong and heroic man named John Coleman. And uh, he was very unfortunate. You see, he went along, you see where the red arrow is to the left. And uh, he uh, went up around Ward's Island and then Randall's Island. Of course, now they're both joined, but he went behind Randall's and up into the Harlem River, which was called Kikishdika, which means the ancient or elder river implying that the first people they knew of had lived there. And you see the waiting place, he went as far as at least to the waiting place into the place called Sharankin, where there was a great standing rock apparently marking the best place to cross. And the path that went there uh, became, I think, part of Fifth Avenue in New York, because it was like the first big trail, one of them. And so then he turned around and went to the, uh, right of Randall's Island to the northeast of it, following the Ranakwa people's land up above, you see that? And then he continued to go east. You see where the red path, uh, what I call the path of blood with the arrows. And you see the little boat representing his very small crew very courageously. But uh, they had gotten apparently tied up with Hell's Gate on the way up and on the way back, which is the very rough waters and had lost a lot of time so by the time they got up to Aquahung or the Bronx River, it was getting late and a fog was rolling in and they unwittingly went to where those white squares are, which are these long houses where the people were making wampum and it was very valuable to them. And they thought that he was an invader. So uh, he was shot and got uh, in the throat. And then they turned around, as you see the arrows go, the dotted arrows going the other way, went around Randall's again, around Ward's, and again got caught in Hill's Gate. But then they went in between the uh, Minahanock Island, which is now Roosevelt Island, and through that channel with Queens on their right. And so this is interesting, of course, because Minahanock means the, uh, literally in this case, uh, the blue plums growing at the mouth of a tributary. And you see Sunkees Creek right there, which is now, uh, you know, it has still there. And um, it's in, you know, that area of Queens near Howitz Point. And um, we're at uh, Sunwick, I believe it's called now, Sunwick. And then they made their way to Staten Island again, but he died on the way. So here you see where, where the different uh, you know, villages were and R Reshawanis Creek is is to the left there, um, which is now under underground. And Konandikung in very small letters in black below that. Uh, I'll talk about that a little in a, in a few minutes. The Konandikung is just off the screen. So the next map I want to look at would be um, perhaps the same one without John. Okay, let, yeah, that's number three, I guess, if you want to. Oh, here's. Okay, that's it. You had it. That's, yeah, go to the map you just had. You got it right. Okay, so that's, we have it without John Coleman's blood. But that was the, the trauma that started it all and started off uh, not only with Henry Hudson being much more wary, but uh, Robert Jewett, his first mate, being somewhat scared of the situation and, and ended up, uh, there were killings on the way. But here you see that Hell's Gate and right above that, this, you know, Randall's 
Um, so that's orange color means it was run by, uh, administered by the Canarsie chiefs of Brooklyn. We're gonna look at them in a minute. And then go to number three, uh, number four. And here's a much more of a view of Queens as it was then. And uh, you see Minnehanock. So again, the whole area, I wanna say that not only was Roosevelt Island and Reynolds Island all called Minnehanock. They were all called Minnehanock. It was the Minnehanock region. And it means the whole place where all the blue plums, which were Graves plums, by the way, were growing at the mouth of tributary. So just gives you a quick shot of how uh, Queens may have looked. And then go to number five. And this is where the Satchams were that, that eventually sold that land to the uh, Dutch and then the English, the uh, Marietje Koek, uh, or part of the Canarsie. The yellow area is also Canarsie, as is the green, but there's a distinct regions of Canarsie chiefs in, uh, in what is now Brooklyn. So all of Brooklyn was Canarsie. So I wanted to show you that briefly to get a sense of how it wasn't just people living on their land and selling the land. They had a more complex government where the, uh, you know, the Sachems in Brooklyn were actually administering the land over at Roosevelt Island. And then go to number six here. And this is a map where it's a larger, covering a larger area. And so you see how uh, Manhattan we well, see Staten Island in the lower left, but above that's Manhattan. And then above that is uh, Queens. Uh, well, there's Brooklyn and Queens to the side and it's orange meaning this, this Muncie speaking area. So this whole place that you see on this map is Manahatawak, which is a, not very well known, but was an actual uh, Native American designated trade region. Um, means, you know, place of many rocky islands where the people live. So they all traded with each other with various dialects and all getting along pretty peacefully. So uh, go to the next seven. seven. Just briefly, this is turned around a little bit, but um, I don't know if you can turn it clockwise, but the, um, yeah, it's that easy. Everything's easy. Okay, so this is a map I made. It's theoretically showing where the uh, Muncie That's language to the, on the bottom and upwards, there's another line, the language line for the tap end on the east and on the, well, on the west, and on the east is the Siwanoi. And so Randall's Island is right there in this Muncie area in the East River. Um, so it's a little more complicated than people think. So then uh, I think one more would be good. Okay, this is lower Manhattan, so I understand it. And the yellow is Canarsie as well, not just Brooklyn, but Lower Manhattan was Canarsie and uh, lots of roadways in Lower Manhattan. And um, so that's uh, just, I'll just show you that. There's quite a lot going on. Maybe we'll go back to it. And let's go to nine, uh, number nine, very briefly. This is to show how the Mohawks were getting to these wampum factories through back channels. Uh, these are rivers that were portageable, meaning where the red areas are, they could pick up their boats and carry their boats a very short distance, get into another river system and continue traveling. So by using this, they could go from the Hudson to the, I guess, uh, I don't know if my, here's the Muscuta, which is the name of the East River. They recognized that it was not a river, but uh, kind of a strait. So they did not call it a river. They were correct. They called it Muscuta, which is like a, a marshy, uh, you know, place of reeds. And they could have come in here to the Kichuan and then to the Hudson here, there's a little portage and they go on on the Wampus River, which is still there sort of, but you know, with those reservoirs and it goes down to the Bronx River that way. And uh, so they end up showing up at these wampum factories to do major trade, which is the basis of a huge economy and an economic system at the time. But of course the, um, those were sacred as well. Those wamba belts had a sacred purpose. And I like to compare them to uh, stained glass windows, which have great economic value, but spiritual value as well. And there's other portages on this map, but that's what I wanted to show you. Roger, perhaps you can add 
something into this as well. And I'd like to know what, why has all this history been lost? You know, these, you know, these beautiful maps that um, Evan has created and shown. And, and I might say, Evan, that they are, um, some of your work is up on the Gracie Mansion Conservancy website. Um, there's a very interesting, some history there, if, if anyone wants to read that. But, but Roger, you know, why is the history lost? And perhaps you can tell us a little bit about the, about the people. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, Nikki, if you could bring up some of the slides, I'd like to talk over them sure. while we present them. I think that history, history is really sort of a different type of language intelligence that is particular to different people. And so some people are more interested in history than others. And if it's not, if it's not written about and if it's not talked about, well then that history is gonna be lost. But amongst Native Americans, they talk about history all the time because as a communicative uh, spoken language, the, the, the whole basis of their knowledge is based on what they're able to communicate and how they do that. And so, uh, you know, if it's just not in you, you're not gonna learn the history or you're not gonna be interested in it. But if you're amongst people that, whose practices are based on the spoken language, well, then you're gonna hear it. Uh, me particular, I, I was born and raised in East Harlem, and if you go down and the next slide, Nikki, uh, keep going. I'm sorry. Uh, I began to realize as a young kid, keep going down. I began to realize as a young kid that, uh, yeah, keep going down a little bit further now, that I lived in a watershed in the basin. Hey, that's one good picture right there. And a watershed is really, uh, where the water flows down into a basin. And if you're familiar with the topography of Manhattan, of New York, of East Harlem, the next slide, please, you begin to realize that there's high ground like west of Fifth Avenue and also to south of uh, 98th Street. But everything on the opposite side of that is the drainage of the water. And, and so uh, East Harlem was a natural marshland that you, uh, unless, you, unless you really think about it, you wouldn't really, it would be difficult to imagine because of the concrete and everything being underground. But East Harlem was a magnificent resource in the sense that it was a very large marshland. As Evan said, he called it a mascota. And so marshlands, a very, very rich in resources in a sense that it's loaded with shellfish, waterfowl, fish, animals. And so it was a, a very productive, resourceful uh, hunting ground and fishing ground. And so the Indians of, of Manhattan, uh, try another slide, please. There you go, there's a greater area of the watershed, you can see. Uh, the next slide, please. You will see that, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, go mm -hmm. up a little. You will see that uh, that was a favoring place for hunting and fishing. And so of course the Indians made it a, uh, along the East River coastline of East Harlem, it was a, uh, a trading place because it was uh, the proximity to the trails that led northward and also to eastward up into Connecticut. And so with the bountiful fish that was there, there was a summer camp along the stretches of the East River from basically 126th Street down to uh, 120th Street. And that is where the Dutch, when they came up, found the summer camp and decided to trade with the locals because that's what the Dutch do, that, that the great, one of the greatest traits is that they're great tradesmen, merchants, and they saw the value of that. And so they established a, a trading post up in what is now known as Harlem, which was called by them early in the settlement of the Dutch, uh, New Harlem. And that established basically a foothold to the resources that they were looking for. And it created a, a relationship with the local inhabitants there, 
until, of course, with the later history of, of Cliff's War, where the Indians were basically annihilated by a Dutch commander who came in and disrupted that peace. Evan, you want to speak a little bit more about that? In terms of history? <laughs> uh, Cliff. Also, if we can put a timeline, you know, kind of what, you know, the, the timeline I think would be helpful here as well. Oh, during the 1640s, uh, Clef was brought in to direct the, the whole administration of the Dutch in Lower Manhattan. And one of the first things he decided to do was just to wipe out anyone and everyone that was in his way. And of course, the Native American communities that were well established there for many, many years were like were finished pathway. And so he created a war that, that no one supported. Uh, it, it was disastrous and it didn't really play well for the Dutch because uh, when the word got back to Holland and the Netherlands of what he was doing, he was pulled back. And that's when Peter Minuit came in, the, uh, the peg leg uh -huh. to administer the, the whole Manhattan enterprise. Evan, you could speak more about that. You're more knowledgeable. Yeah, yeah the the um, massacre over at the, in New Jersey was uh, February uh, night of February 26, 1643, and then there was one over at uh, near Somers in February 1644, and so a lot of the natives left at that time just on their own to avoid further uh, danger, and that. But then you know they the of course they fought back. There was a great war uh, over this. And so the natives eventually lost and you know there was a peace treaty, but really they were the losers. And uh, so they went further north, but also yes, that um, it was Keeft who was really uh, sent away eventually. But before he left, he gave some land to Classens who was uh, given the land which is now you know, Gracie Mansion, and he called it Horn's Hook after a place in Holland. And then he negotiated with Chief Wilhelm. I know it sounds English, but it's not Wilhelm. It's sort of like, just means the head man. And he's a chief and he apparently successfully negotiated for that land and continued to maintain it. Uh, he built a house there and that eventually became a fort and then eventually became the site of Gracie Mansion. And that's, within sight of Randall's Island. And, but and what, uh, Keith was, go ahead. And what was exactly on, I mean, when we see, um, Roger, you mentioned fishing, uh, and I know you and Chris have fished in, in the East River together. And, you know, obviously, what, you know, you always see people fishing along there when, when I ride my bicycle along the river. Um, so, what what would have been on Randall's Island? Were the communities there, and and what you know the fishing was that part of commerce? Perhaps you can help us on you know think about what it what it was like. Well, with the marshland and the low lying grounds of East Holland, and the and the and the East River actually splitting up at uh, Randall and Ward's Island to connect with the Long Island Sound and to move further west and north to connect with the Hudson River as estuary, there was a abundance of, 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 of fish food, of fish just migrating and moving up and down. And with the marshland, you had crabs, you had shellfish, other things that bigger fish eat. And that, and that, also, that also attracted the waterfowl that was there. I mean, it was just a very resourceful, plentiful, area for food and what the people depended mm -hmm. on. And even today, it's just a real great fishing area. The guys there that catch some awfully big fish and many of them, although the quality of the water is questionable, uh, there are fish that move up mm -hmm. and down that that tributary, that estuary system. You know, they call yeah. uh, also oh. part of many Hanak, that um, island, Randall's Island, apparently it was called Manhattan, which means there were the blue plums on there too somehow. Uh, you know, we can kind of deduce that, but also in the general area over 
on the queen side only a few hundred feet away there was beds of oysters which uh henry hudson first tasted on his birthday 40th birthday september 12th of 1609 by the way and said well these are some of the best oysters in the world and he was right and that word spread and that's why everyone came over you see part of the story now, Robert McFarlane, the, the British author, who, who's, um, I, I love his writing, and he, he, had, he wrote a book about, he, he traveled around England and looked at lost language. And, you know, Evan, in so many of the, even the words that you used and the words on your maps and the names of places, as I mentioned, you know, it, it's, it's been lost. And, and we, you know, how do we, how do we, keep some of that language and and bring it back i mean do we bring it back through education through other other programs now that are being done in schools to to help reintroduce some of this language i was uh you know i have a couple of books about the munsi language the local lenape languages and i was at a, a book stand a woman came up i said would you like to buy this book about lenape language she says well that's not my language i'm not going to buy that book and I thought, okay, I can understand that, but maybe it's not a priority, but also, you know, you have to look beyond the immediate priorities in order to really resuscitate a native language when it's not your own. So native people, as you read in, in Sweet Gathering Sweetgrass, she has a wonderful section about the difficulties in learning Potawatomi, which right. I totally identify with. But to learn it, that difficult language when it's not yours, that takes a vision. You have to have a sense of, of you know, personal responsibility for your, your land, you know, your continent, your turtle island, and, and go beyond the immediate, uh, you know, what you have to do, you know, tonight exactly. And that can be very hard. So that's the, my first answer. But also, to um, you know, some of our teachers have passed away. And I'm so glad that, you know, having Roger among us and so strong and active and all his knowledge is a blessing. But uh, in the past 20 years, we've lost some elders who were speaking these languages. And I was, I saw that coming in for 30 years. I've been trying to write all this down and interview everybody in case that happened, of course. And um, so, you know, it's important to me, but uh, yeah, without the elders speaking it in our ears, it's, it's just that much harder. And there are recordings and there are, you know, language books for our languages. Uh, but you have you, the lovely, beautiful, and intriguing languages, and in which is mostly verbs about, you know, uh, Robin says, like, now it's like 70% verbs in our Algonquian languages. That's about true, too, at mm -hmm. least. So that's just, you know, a little answer. Yeah, and, and it, it, since it was such an oral tradition, um, I, I was at an exhibition recently on, called Wayfaring on, on maps of the White Mountains in New Hampshire. And, and, and it mentioned, I mean, some of the Native American, I mean, they were the, obviously they were the, Earl, they were the ones there first, but they sort of had a, a sense of this internally or it was on bark. And so that, that sometimes they don't exist, you know, they might've been on a tree or something. And so, you know, the maps yeah. themselves no longer exist. So we're not left with some of these things. Well, birch bark was the major form of, uh, you know, medium for writing uh, or making marks to different kind of signs. They didn't have a actual writing system as we would think of it so much. Micmac had some hieroglyphic systems, but they would write these messages on bark thinking they would, you know, of course last a long time, but hundreds of years have gone by and you ask like why don't we know these things well one thing i was read a study that of the, all the descendants of the original dutch settlers very few of their grandchildren uh great grandchildren are known to have survived the revolution and the travels you know even the dutch were driven west along with some of these natives and there were many wars i mean just a dozen wars and a lot of them died. So not even all the Dutch survived were their great grandchildren. And along with them, the Native Americans were being pushed out by, uh, by treaties and by wars and disease. And so it's not so surprising, but as, they, as people uh, you know, have their diasporas, they often do lose some of the knowledge of the land. They may preserve knowledge of their foods and their customs, but it's harder to remember 
So they call it Wenji Yao Kun. And the uh, word uh, mask is a word they used for the for the plums, by the way. Not very well known. <laughs> yeah. But I hope that gives you an idea. Well, I think and there are people still, the native people are still there too. I don't want to ever imply that there are not those underground living and, and you know working together to preserve their culture, right? In New York, it happens all the time. I run into it all the time. People uh, I run into who are like Native Americans and they're preserving their culture right in New York City. Yes, and I, you know, I think that that's what's so beautiful about reading Robin's book because you know when she tells us these beautiful stories, you know, like, I mean, the sky, you know, the first story, and then the other ones that that bring together, um, you know, animals and the earth and and you know everything and they're, they're beautiful stories, um, and we should all know those stories and. And there were beautiful ceremonies. So how can we learn more about some of the special ceremonies? I want to mention um, that there was a, uh, right there in Queens, the Matinica would have the Nunawin, uh, Nunawin ceremonies in the October time. And they're focused on storytelling and focused on telling stories about how they came to be and how they came to uh, have such abundant food. And you ask, well, what it is, what is a Nunawin? Well, it's just like a Gumwin. Ha ha. It's, a Gumwin is the Lenape, it's somewhat similar. That's also in October. Uh, and, you know, you can make your own. You can, it, a Gumwin is a bunch of, you know, the Lenape people, would they be under the trees, lying on the ground, or standing and talking or dancing? and they would converse and share philosophic insights and listen to music. And I thought, where have I experienced that in, in Manhattan? It's actually, I was at the Simon and Garfunkel concert in Central Park, and they were telling us stories, they were singing songs, and everybody was one communal body, all loving and friendly, that I could see for miles, and uh, you know, saying, hey, haven't seen you in years, how are you doing? All this is going on at once. And it's a very positive experience. There's a half a million people. That's a pretty big tribe. They say the Muncie rarely gathered in over like a hundred in a village, but I'm saying some people did that. They made it happen, and it was just like a gunwin. And we can do that at various times. Like for example, in Washington Square Park, it has always had a kind of that spontaneous gathering feeling, right? There's music. People tell stories. People reunite. You know, they eat. And it's a lot like that gum win, but of course it's not a real one because it's not done traditionally, but people are just doing that because they know this is a good thing to do. So that's like one answer, okay? And in my movie that Roger and I made together, which of course I have to plug, it's a wonderful movie, that touring native New York, the 90 minute documentary, we go there and we're looking for signs of things that echo the spirit of the original people. And we find it everywhere. And that's what's wonderful about Manhattan too, is that people still, they wander around, they all meet each other in the street. You know, it's not like they're in their cars, they're walking and they're conversing and being very creative. And that's what we found while touring Native New York. Now, how can we see your film? Is that uh, somewhere that people can, Nikki could perhaps put something in the chat or is it, is it on YouTube or a place that people can look at it? Roger. Uh, well, I've, I've videotaped Evan as we walked through Lower Manhattan, and it was a wonderful 90-minute tour of New York that he narrates, but I don't know, do you still, do you have, you have copies of that for sale? Evan? Yes, I, I do. I have DVD copies, and um, yeah, I, I still have a bunch of them, and that was on Manhattan Cable, if we can, if we're allowed to say that. But I guess, I don't know if that can ever be broadcast again, but you said it was broadcast many times. Yeah, I, I, have, a, the... yeah, I have a television show on Manhattan Cable, and I also have a website that Nikki will share with everyone that has a, a compilation of various videos that I think people might be interested in. But, uh, Since both of you, I, I want to be able to leave some time for... Uh, um, to answer some questions that we had in the chat, but 
you know, we've just started reading this book. What, what advice can you give us as we read through it from your perspective as Native Americans? What, is there anything that you, as you've looked through it, that you think um, we should think about? We'll be looking at nature in one program. We're going to hopefully do a program on beating. Um, you know, we're, we're gonna try to really explore the book. So is there anything that you think we should particularly look at? I think when you concentrate and pay attention to whatever, is it, whatever it is that you're doing, particularly if you're reading, to leave your senses open because there's signs that float and that reach you that make an impact on how you're able to receive that. That message is all around. You just have to be in tune and 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 receptive to that to to receive that. We we call them confirmation in, in my tribe. So like you feel something, you know, maybe maybe something falling on your shoulder or something that you hear coming out of the window it might be a bird singing to you. Okay. You know, those are confirmations. It's just going along with what you're concentrating on doing. And it adds to, you know, your understanding and knowledge of, of what you're trying to comprehend. And also, you know, I think that... Oh, sorry. Oh, I would just say that one of the things that strikes me about the book, Gathering Sweetgrass, is her connectivity you know, it's a heart opening book, but also she's using everyday life situations and, and then showing you how profoundly deep it is with meaning if you allow it. So, you know, to kind of open your mind and be intuitive while you're reading it and enjoy the, the beauty of the, uh, the connectivity in, in the uh, native everyday connections that she describes. I like the, the pecan story really oh, is wonderful right at the beginning. It's just they kind of think for themselves. I have, I, you know, I, I, was, I was going through my copy this morning and, you know, I mark up my books that I, it, I got there and I have all these marked passages all the way through and they're, they're just all, it's, it's such a, such a special and beautiful book. Nikki, um, there is a day on, there is something coming up at Randall's Island also, isn't there? Perhaps you can tell us about that. Yes, um, to celebrate uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, there will be um, uh, se multiple celebrations over a two or three day period, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, um, over uh, the 9th, I think this is the 9th through 11th of October. Um, that will be open, uh, it will be near the stadium, being held near the stadium. Um, and I can definitely share out more information about that in terms of uh, what that will be about and also the hours that it will be going on so that again people are more than welcome to join us on the island do we have any questions nikki i haven't had a chance to look at the chat um if i'm gonna actually read ann's comment that she made just because i think it's it's wonderful as i understand it so far in my reading kimmerer writes about nature perceived in native american culture as offering freely shared and exchanged gifts and about shared land use as opposed to individual ownership. Perhaps a public park like Randall's Island ideally gestures toward collective land ownership, shared use and stewardship in a similar spirit. So I thought that was, thank you, Anne. Yeah. And also Jane added the language of um, animacy section was interesting. Right. Yeah, in my uh, Gracie Mansion article, which is on their website, I mentioned that when Willem comes over to see Classens for the first time, I just bet that he wasn't just interested in receiving a bunch of trinkets for the land. They often had a land sharing arrangement where the natives would have access to some of the resources. For example, an eagle tree, a tree with an eagle's nest in it would be uh, continually valuable to collect the tail feathers for ceremony. And so I speculated that Willem had a lot of you know, give backs, a lot of requests for, uh, you know, treating over that land. And so, um, you know, that's my guess. And that we do have some treaties that from Brooklyn and Manhattan that show such things as uh, eagle nests. Uh, how you, what, what's the legal term, Roger, if you're a, a uh, you know, that extra little um, 
addendum. I, I know the word, I can't think of it right now, but uh, they would have those in the treaty. What? A binder? Yeah, like that. Okay, you can have the land, but we want the eagle the eagle feathers. So it probably is probably is actually true in that thing. And you I know, think so they, they both had a one of you not just that's a sharing, but it's not a selling exactly. One of you mentioned a woman chief that the, the Dutch had difficulty um, communicating with because they they you know weren't used to dealing with women and she was what on 97th Street or something like that. Yeah, Park Avenue in 97, there was a village with uh, 25, I think, wigwams. And Conan de Kong is a Dutch word, meaning uh, uh, queen then king. <laughs> so she was a queen to them, like the wife of the chief. Then he dies, then she becomes the quote unquote king. And so she had complete power as a sachem. And not that far from uh, the place we're talking about, you know, Hell's Gate. It was a steep slope and, you know, and it was up on that hill where Park Avenue is. And then they had the higher ground and they took upon themselves, you know, a bit of sovereignty there. And uh, so she, you know, it's interesting, right across from there, across from right what's now Roosevelt Island was that uh, Sonkisk or the uh, Sunkwick, as we call it here, Sunswick, which means a sunny camp, but that's ridiculous. But it's referring to the, probably the same woman who must have been very powerful. Mm -hmm. So Kanan de Kung, and that was the name of the native village in a Dutch word, because they spoke Dutch mostly. Yeah, the Dutch, the Dutch didn't do business negotiations with women. And so they had to find a happy medium in order to conduct their trade. Mm -hmm. So do, do Native Americans gather together here in New York? I mean, are there other organizations in East Harlem where people look at the history together? Well, there, there, are, there are annual events, such as the one that's being uh, held at Randall's Island for the October 12th uh, weekend. But from my own point of view in my neighborhood, we get together every weekend. Anytime you hear a guy playing a conga or somebody rasking a guido, you know, those are like, that brings people together. And so it's like basically just hanging out outside, especially in the summertime. Central Park is a favorite place. Randall's Island was always a very popular place. I mean, you know, you look around, you'll see it. And then, uh, you know, that if there are elders there and you ask them questions, they'll be happy to talk about all the, all the different knowledge that they're willing to share. And that's Inward what Park I always Park. brought up. Yeah. Yeah, Inward Park is basically next to the Harlem, the old Harlem River where it used to be. And people gather there sometimes, you know, native people. And there's an Indian road. And uh, a lot, sometimes these in the winter, these meetings might happen at a restaurant where everybody kind of knows everybody and they don't kick them out. <laughs> right? There's, some... There's a schedule of, of, of events throughout, throughout the year and they're sponsored by different groups and organizations. And within my own tribe, we call those arietos. And arietos are uh, music and dance and just the tribal gathering. And so uh, I belong to an organization. I'm an enrolled member of the United Confederation of Dino People. And we have a website that sort of promotes the schedule. That's www.uctp.org. And it shows basically uh, where and when uh, we'll be participating in those arietos. Mm -hmm. And it's also, my I'm sorry. Okay, Evan. Evan, you no, saying, but... your career, um, you know, researching and writing about all of this history. What are you working on now? Well, I'm working on uh, uh, at uh, Dennings Point. There's a big center run by Clarkson University, and they've asked me to do a retrospective that will stay up for a while with like do a dozen maps, maybe dozens of maps. Some of them very, very large 
about the Hudson Valley. Some and we'll put in some New York City maps there too as well. So that's what I'm working on. And also uh, the day after tomorrow, working on a Zoom for the town of Rochester with renaming all the rivers according to their original names as, as we can uh, reduce them. What a wonderful American. project. So it'll be really fun. So that's uh, seven o'clock on Friday, but I'm not sure how you get there, but it's the Ro Friends of Rochester Historical. So those are some things right immediately. It's a very busy time, like right now. <laughs> Working on a lot of new maps, uh, you'll be happy to know, Elizabeth. Great, good. And I enjoy it. Great. I enjoy it. Well, thank Oh, and there's a book. Oh, I put them in a book. Uh, there's two books. One is Mapping Manahattawak, and the other is Mapping Native New York. And they're filled, these books are like handbooks, or study books, and filled with maps. And they're at my website, uh, www.algonquinculture.org. And you can even get Roger Hernandez's beautiful movie, that I'm uh, featured in called Touring Native New York, which is a very special, wonderfully crazy film. <laughs> well, I want to uh, thank you both. It, this was absolutely fascinating. And I, I think it's just, you know, it, it's, I think it was like kind of like going to a restaurant and having a tasting menu, you know, so that we, you, you've given all of us a sense of the research that we need, you know, the reading that we need to do. And as we're, reading through Robin's book and looking at other books for, and, and as we're braiding sweetgrass, <laughs> it's so wonderful um, that you've just opened our world. And, you know, I, I, I'm going, when we end the Zoom call, I'm gonna go back to the book again and read a little more because it's, uh, it's so fascinating. And I feel like we just, we need to, um, you know, really delve into it. So thank you. Can I say one thing about Robin's work? We haven't done. There's very important discovery she made uh, to interviewing elders that when you pick the sweet grass and you pull it out and you harvest it and use it, more grows than would have grown otherwise. And that was the major discovery. And that helped launch the whole formation of the TEK movement, traditional ecological knowledge. And she wrote a wonderful article in a science magazine that really launched a whole tremendous interest in traditional ecological knowledge. And I was giving a speech in Canada right after that came out. Um, and I mentioned this and I said, well, Canada should have like an apartment of TEK. And I was kind of joking. And then afterwards, this guy came up and said, well, I'm the you know, director of Parks Canada and I like your idea and we're gonna do it. And they did it. Why can't America do that? Well, I think this okay. is just the beginning. I think we want to hear more from both of you about all of this, and um, I'm sure I'm sure something, some programs will be established. Good. We need them. <laughs> Nikki, thank you all so much. Thank you, Evan and Roger and Elizabeth. That was amazing and really and yes, I feel like there's I don't know which direction to go in first, um, but all wonderful information. Um, and I'm sure we'll continue this conversation as well. Um, and our next uh, conversation is on October 13th. I just put the, the date in the chat. I will follow up. I know we were given, uh, Evan and Roger, thank you for the, all the amazing um, information and sharing you did as well. And I'll try to put all that together and share that out in an email um, for follow-up. Um, so we thank you for that. And we hope to see you all next time um, back here in, in a month. Thank you. <laughs> And on the island, perhaps walking on a beautiful autumn day. Yes, please come join us. Okay. We, we are doing outside activities. So please come and join us on the island. Our harvest festival is coming up. So please check out on our website and, and, and come visit us as well. We would love to see you. And thank you again, all of you. Thank you. <laughs> Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Roger.